Good morning, everybody. It's a real privilege for me to stand in this morning. And uh, I trust that God's word will be a blessing to us. We started off this year with um, some, I like to call them, tips for Christian fitness. The first one was that we read a chapter of the Bible every day. Second one, go to church once a week. The third one, join a gospel group or a Bible study group. And then the fourth one was to get involved in ministry. And our theme today is how we serve the master. Ministry is important, uh, as we'll see and as we've heard already, but how we serve, the Bible teaches us, is far more important. So we are, folks, we're just going to dip in a, into a huge bowl of truth that we've read here, and uh, the portion is 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, we're just going to take a teaspoon and just scoop out uh, a truth that I trust will help you and help me to serve the Lord more effectively. So let's just look at the Church of Corinth. I don't know how to describe it. We can't judge them. But as Paul writes, it speaks of chaos. Um, Paul starts off in our reading this morning. He says, I can't speak to you as grown-up people, as adults. He says, you are little children. I I've got to give you milk. Um, and, and you can imagine just if you paint the picture in your mind of adults walking around with bottles and drinking milk. He says, I can't give you solid food. You are children. And then two crucial words to describe them. He says, you aren't spiritual, but you are worldly. You aren't spiritual, but you are carnal. You don't walk in the spirit, you walk in the flesh, to put it in another way. And then, reading from the first chapter, we hear that there were, it's hard to even verbalize it. Uh, there was somebody who was sleeping with his stepmother. And uh, Paul says, we hear these things and it's shocking. And we must remember that the Bible doesn't say that there was a Christian doing this. It says it's happening in the church. So the truth of the matter is we have different churches, and not everybody in the church is necessarily a Christian. Um, so there are perhaps people who haven't come to saving faith, uh, but the church comprises basically of those who've come to saving faith and, uh, and serve the Lord and are his children are part of the body of Christ. And folks, the sad thing is that the church in Corinth, people know it for these things that Paul speaks about. The bickering about who follows this one and who follows that one. And May God spare that. You see, the basic problem in this church is that there's a lack of real leadership. Because the job of the leadership is to oversee the church and to deal with issues that are non-biblical, to deal with carnality. And may we remember, folks, may we remember that it's a sign of immaturity if we as Christians don't like to be corrected, taught, rebuked, instructed, a sign of spiritual maturity is a church that submits to the leadership, because that's part of their role, it's part of their role, and in so doing, submit to God. But let's leave the church in Corinth to Paul. 
And uh, let's come down to CCG, to Christchurch, George. And uh, Paul, in his rebuke, in his reprimand of the church, he reminds them of something, and that's what we want to look at this morning. He reminds them of a judgment that's going to take place for Christians. And he uses the analogy of a house. Remember, Jesus and Matthew used an analogy, but the context was the foundation, building on the rock or building on the sand. Paul uses the analogy of the house, but he says the foundation has been laid. So he's speaking to Christians, and this foundation is Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, there's an accountability there. We've sung it, and I'm so grateful for our music team. We, we are really blessed. And... Um, Thankful for the Bible reading. It's a house built on this solid foundation. And he uses terms like um, that day. This is the judgment day. It's a capital D, if you notice in your Bibles. He speaks about that day. He speaks about a fire, which in the Bible is uh, an analogy of judgment. And... Um, he writes in, one, in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11, he's alluding to this, government, this, uh, this judgment. And Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, Therefore, we make it our aim, listen carefully, to be well-pleasing. He's speaking about serving. So our serving is to be well-pleasing to God, pleasing. Remember Hebrews 11.6, without faith it's impossible to please God. That's what we'd like to do. Any child, a normal, healthy child, loves pleasing the parents. That's just a normal thing. And then he goes on to say, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So in Christian circles, we know this judgment as the judgment seat of Christ. It's not a judgment of heaven or hell. This judgment, folks, is about how we build, how we serve. And then Paul uses the analogy. He says, either we building with gold, silver, and precious stones, or we building with wood, hay, and straw, some translations, stubble. Two ways of building. And uh, that is the, the crux, the deciding factor of the rewards of this judgment. The Bible speaks about rewards. We're not going there today. In Revelation, it speaks about a crown that we'll receive uh, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, we're running a race for a prize. Jesus speaks in uh, Matthew chapter 6 and he speaks about a reward that we're going to uh, speak about just now. What's important is that we remember, folks, that we are all in this together. It was made so clear and plain to us last Sunday. We are all, in a way, ministers in, in the sense that we are ministering. We are serving. We are working for the Lord. In 1 Peter 4.10, Peter writes and he says to the brethren, God has given each one of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve what, what, <clears throat> excuse me, use them well to serve one another. So each one of us receives this gift. 
Each one has this gift. I was speaking at a morning service once, and just to make the point, I said it's, it would be so nice if we could start in the front row and each one had to stand up one at a time and tell us what their gifts are. And uh, we had a lady in the church, her name was Bob's or is Bob's. Uh, she comes from a dark background and got radically converted, loved the Lord. And she would just talk. She, you know, nothing was held back with Bob's. And uh, she came to me after that service and she said, you dare do that, Trevor. In other words, you dare ask me to stand up in the service. <laughs> so I took the hint and the, the, the tip. We're all involved in this. And the question is, what are we involved in? We're involved in serving. And the point is how we serve. And how we serve, Paul describes as gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. Paul speaking to the Corinthians in our portion today, he refers to uh, two things. And um, there is a, there is a, a, a context. There, there are components to the serving, how we serve. It's how we serve, wood, hay, and stubble, gold, silver, precious stones, and if we're going to build well, folks, if we're going to build well, I want you to note this, the motivation is love. There is a motive and it is love. Paul writes and he says, the love of Christ constrains me. I like that word. He says it compels me, it forces me. Jesus said it, said it in another way. He says, I must do the works of my Father while it is still day. I must do the works of my Father while it is still day, for the night comes. And I often think when I read these words, I must, I'm compelled. I think of a mother who is expecting a child. And when the time comes for delivery, she doesn't say, oh, I just, wait a minute, I won't do today, I'll do tomorrow. When the birth pangs come, she's compelled. She's, she's got no choice. Um, there's something that forces her into this. And so it is with our serving folks. The motive has got to be and must be God and God alone. The second component, sorry for that delay, the first component is a motive of love. Um, and the second component is the component of the aim and the purpose. The aim and the purpose. Um, are we doing it for our own good? Are we doing it for men's praise? Are we doing it to be acknowledged? You see, folks, there's nothing wrong with thanking. The problem is when we do things to be thanked. I've seen and witnessed, sadly, over the years, people who, when they aren't thanked, take terrible offense at that. I know of a sad incident once where somebody actually left the church because they weren't thanked for something quite substantial that they had done for the church. 
Um, so sad if it is the case. There's a motive of love and the aim of bringing glory to God. Without faith, it is impossible, absolutely impossible, to please God. Let's look at the second reading, Matthew chapter 6, just for a moment. And uh, Jesus is describing the Pharisees, and he's trying to get to these two motives. And he says that the Pharisees do two things. The first thing is they give, but they give to be acknowledged, and they give to be noticed. He says when you give, don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. Well, that's impossible, but Jesus is just making a point, right? Don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. Many years ago, I had a very close relationship to a young man who had been successful in business. And one day he said to me, you know, when I give, which was one of his gifts, when I give... I want to always do it anonymously. And so to this day, people have received whatever, money and things and sometimes considerable, and they have no clue where it came from. Now you may say, well, oh, does that mean that we shouldn't give unless we give anonymously? You see, folks, if we get stuck there, we're making a rule. I can give anonymously and bask in the glory, right? In my heart. And we're still going to look at the heart of the issue. It's not about whether I give anonymously or not. The point is, why do I do it? What is the motive? Does God get the glory? We've looked at those two points. The second thing that... Jesus addresses with the Pharisees, he says, and when they pray, they like to stand on the street corners and uh, they like to be noticed and uh, they like making a show. And you know, folks, eventually church can become a show. I sat with a distraught father just a couple of weeks ago, hadn't seen him for a long time, and he was distraught, this man. He's, he has a son, a lovely young man. He has every intention of serving God. But he came to his dad and he said, Dad, I wouldn't like to go to church. And the dad said, but why my son? He said, you know, Dad, church is just a show. That was his reason. One day in Paris, this is in the late 1700s, early 1800s, a man came to a doctor, I don't know whether he was a psychiatrist or a psychologist. The man slumped down in the chair opposite the doctor and he said, Doctor, I I'm absolutely at the end of myself. I don't know what to do anymore. I'm discouraged. Sometimes I think of just finishing it off. He said, what must I do? So the doctor said to him, listen, young man, um, there's a, a man in Paris at the moment. His name is Grimaldi. He's a, um, a guy who goes around, hires the biggest halls, gets crowds of people, and they fill the halls, and uh, he makes people laugh. We, we have such people today. That's, that's their job. They, uh, they stand in the front and, um, what do they call these guys? Sorry? Politician. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. He said, listen, you go. Book a ticket, go one night, and um, listen to this man. He says there are people who leave after his shows, and... 
they are totally transformed. They, they all of a sudden have hope in life and uh, they see life through different glasses. And uh, he says, you just go along, try it. And the man looked at the doctor seriously and he said, doctor, I am Grimaldi. <laughs> I'm the one that puts on these shows. Um, I, I'm the one that uh, gives us the impression that I've got it all, right? I'm the one that makes people think I am which, something which I, I, I'm not really. Uh, I'm the one that's putting on the show. I am Grimaldi. Um, folks, God forbid that our lives become that show or that act or let's call it a way of life. We've looked at the components of love um, where Paul says I'm constrained and the aim of bringing glory to God, the references uh, we've read. And remember, it's all about building. Am I building with gold, silver, precious stones? The judgment's going to come, and that judgment is for the church. And when we judged, when this fire burns of judgment, the gold, silver, and precious stones remain. <laughs> it remains. May our service for God be remaining. Something that will stand that test and not be something that will be consumed by fire. Perhaps I can say it in this way. You see, folks, God wants the heart. God wants the heart. There was a man one day, he used to come home with a healthy check, salary check. Uh, those were the days of checkbooks. And uh, he had a, a nice home. His wife had all that she needed and sometimes what she wanted. Um, so he, he was doing all the right things. And one day his wife came to him and she said, tell me, do you love me? Do you really love me? And you know, I understand that, that cry. There are some husbands that would like to ask the questions of their wives sometimes. Do, do you really love me? So the man turned to his wife and he said, listen, when we got married, I told you that I love you. And if I change my mind, I'll let you know. So that was the sum total of his heart towards his wife. She, she wanted to know what, what he really felt, uh, what was in the heart. One day God comes to the prophet Samuel and he says to Samuel, Israel chose to have a king. Uh, they wanted a king. And uh, I've chosen Saul and now I've rejected him. And uh, I want you to go to the farm of Jesse um, and anoint a new king. So off Samuel goes to Jesse's farm, and as we know, he had a few sons, and they did things the way one would have done in that culture, the way one thinks things should be done. And he called Eliab, the oldest son, and he said, well, here he is. And God says to Samuel, no, it's not him. Eventually they went to the second, third, fourth, fifth son, and when they'd all stood before Samuel and God had said no, Samuel says, well, Jesse, is there somebody else? Oh, Jesse said, I nearly forgot. There's a little boy, David. He's the youngest one. He's there in the fields looking after the sheep. And Samuel said, call him. And when Dan, David comes, uh, God says to Samuel, anoint him. And then he says these profound words, God speaking to Samuel. He says, Samuel, man looks at the outward, but
but God sees the heart. He searches the heart. God assesses by the heart, not by the outward. And I don't know how many times in my life I've failed utterly by judging somebody by the outward, only to be totally embarrassed, ashamed, to find out, oh my word, I was completely wrong. I, I, I assessed, I judged. Completely from a human point of view, I did it from the outside. And God simply just says, I want the heart. We're building with gold, silver, and precious stones. That's this judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. And I urge you today, as we find and realize this is my gift, this is my way of serving, this is what God has given to me, and it's different. Some are in the open. Like, for example, Sean, we see him every Sunday almost, and we hear him, and he's uh, on the chat, and uh, he's there. Others aren't there. Others are in the shadows. Uh, others, you, you don't see them. You, you, don't, uh, you don't know what they're doing. Some are praying and they're praying in the closet. Um, and others are doing other things of help and administering and so forth and so forth. And here God is urging us, build, build right, serve the master in the right way, build with gold, silver, and precious stones. I'm closing. Once we were in the very center of what was then Zululand, uh, the place where one of the nations of our country are found, the Zulus. And uh, it was a rough period. Um, it was uh, in the 60s, 70s, early 80s, uh, there were faction fights. Sometimes at the police stations, they, they didn't have enough place in their mortuaries. They'd, they'd pile bodies in piles, literal piles this high. Uh, they couldn't keep up at the rate people were being killed and, and murdered. And there was a rural church in the middle of all this. Uh, the people weren't that well educated. Um, some of them were older, many younger, younger people. And they asked us to do an in-house Bible college or Bible, uh, Bible school, if you will, here in the church at that particular location. And so we did this, and it was a very precious time for me in any case. And to cut a long story short, somehow through somebody's contact with somebody in America, this person heard about what we were doing, and he volunteered, and he said, listen, I'd love to come. And uh, he was a, a Bible teacher, a lecturer. Uh, he was pastoring a church, and he used to take his holidays <laughs> and pay his own way. And year after year, his name was Lester Orwick, he'd come, and he had a special gift of teaching the Bible. It's a special gift. And uh, he would come every year, and one year he came with a, a one-meter model of the tabernacle with every fine detail of what God had told Israel, or how God had told Israel to build this tabernacle. And so for the three weeks that we had set aside, um, the students were spoilt, literally spoilt, with this foreshadow of the Christ that was going to come, the tabernacle where God's presence was in the Old Covenant. One day during a lecture, 
Lester put out a, a question. And he said, tell me, if you would have to sum up your Christianity, uh, just in a handful, five, four, three, four, five words, how would you describe, how would you say, um, in a few words, sum up your faith? And of course, the students put up their hands and everybody had, or most of the people had their contribution and they were good contributions. And eventually Lester Orwick said, may I um, offer my suggestion? And he just said four words. He said, for his name's sake. He said, that would sum up my faith. You see, folks, when we give for his name's sake, when we minister, however that is, for his name's sake, not for attention, not for our glory, not to be thanked, not to be honored, but for his name's sake. We used to, in our youth group, sing, and we used to sing songs in Zulu and English and Afrikaans. And one of the songs we used to sing in Afrikaans was, you might know it, Mutek Khan, Med Handa. Mutek Suur, Mahir on Mut. Almost paraphrasing it in English, is it really right, is it necessary to meet the Lord? empty-handed, having built with wood, hay, and stubble, is, must I really meet him in that way, just empty-handed? Folks, I, I would urge you today, and, and I would afresh like to say to the Lord, Lord, thank you for the gift you've given me. It might be small, it might be big in men's eyes, in God's eyes, it's all the same. Service to him is to his glory. But may we be encouraged today to do it for his name's sake and his name's sake alone. Shall we bow our heads and pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray this morning that you would forgive us for times when we've sought our own honor and our own glory. When we've done things, Lord, not with a motive of love for the master, but possibly love for ourselves. Where we failed, Lord, to do what we do to bring honor and glory to you alone and brought honor and glory to ourselves. We thank you, Father, this morning for the gifts that you've given us, each and every one of your children, the body of Christ. You've given a gift, and to some you've given more than one, to be used, to serve one another, your word teaches us, to serve one another, and then to serve beyond one another, to serve beyond the church as we seek to evangelize the world. We would like to just say, Lord, we recommit, we rededicate our lives to you this morning for that cause for that purpose, for your honor and for your glory. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus, amazing grace, a grace that we'll voice and sing for all eternity. The love of the Father, amazing love, 
a dying love in the precious and real fellowship of the Holy Spirit. As we go into this week, Lord, with its challenges, grant us that grace, a fresh vision of that love, and the reality of that fellowship. In Jesus' precious name, amen.